Amen. On that truth, let's go in prayer to God as we prepare to open up this word this morning. Y'all join me in worship today. Father, we thank you and praise you for answered prayers. Father, I ask that you would always keep us accountable in our hearts, lives, so that we might not hinder our prayers being answered. For your word makes it very clear that many times our prayers are answered because of sin in our lives or some ways or some something that's between us and you. Father, I ask right now that you would forgive me and cleanse my heart right now as I stand before you, before your people, in preaching your word. I ask that you would empower me, strengthen me, prepare me, and most importantly, you be glorified, you be seen and exalted through your word this morning. We praise you and continue to worship you through your word. In Jesus' name. You know, in our world today, there's much conversation and discussion about what faith is. You know, you ask people about faith, and how many of us have talked about taking a risk, and you hear somebody saying, hey, you need to just take a leap of faith, right? You know, this past week, I went on the internet to find out, hey, what's the world, what do people in the world define faith? What do they say faith is? One person said that, that faith is a, a state of mind which must be active, not passive, to be useful in achieving lasting success. Another self-help author and speaker said that, that faith will not bring you what you desire, but it will show you the way to go after it for yourself. I'll share one more. Uh, another person said, close the door to fear behind you, and, and you will quickly see the door of faith open before you. That's what the world says faith is. But last week we saw in God's world that the Bible says that, that, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You may recall we were in Hebrews chapter 11 where we saw last week that, that God defines faith and describes faith. We also saw where faith is designed as a purpose for faith. And we also looked at a divine faith that we saw, the kind of faith that pleases God, and the kind of faith that God rewards from his people. And I shared with you last week that I believe that the crisis in the church today is a lack of faith. I mean, we know what faith is. We say we have faith, but when it comes down to it, I don't believe we really have the faith that God calls us to have as his people. And if you don't believe me, as I said last week, you know, if we're going to see God do amazing things through his people and around us, then we've got to believe that God can do it and will do it. If you and I are going to see God do the impossible, we have to believe that God can and will do the impossible in us, through us, and around us. And that's why I am preaching a series I've entitled The Faith Factor. And of course, last week I had to start from the beginning. Hey, what is faith? I mean, what does God's word say about faith? But before I could go any further... Before I can even talk about any topics in the Bible about the kind of faith that, that, that impresses Jesus or the kind of faith that proves confidence in God, we must talk about saving faith. Because you must understand, before we can even talk about faith, there is no faith without saving faith. So what is saving faith? Well, we're going to open up God's Word this morning in Romans chapter 10. If you want to open up with me, Romans chapter 10, we'll look at in just a moment. Romans 10, I'll start in verse 6 in just a moment. Now, the word faith is used in the New Testament over 300 times in accordance to salvation. I mean, did you realize the word faith is used 300 times in the New Testament as relating to salvation, being saved? And at the end of, of Romans chapter 9, Paul begins to give a correlation, a comparison between Israel, the Jews in Israel, and Gentiles. It begins to give this comparison that the Jews were relying on their works, obeying the law for righteousness, and they were failing. But yet the Gentiles were just relying on what? Faith for righteousness. That they were much closer, they actually obtained this righteousness through faith, saving faith. Well, as we go through and we unpack God's Word this morning in, in Romans chapter 10, I'm going to show you what God's Word says about saving faith and how that applies to you and I this day as God's people or maybe there's someone here that needs to hear and understand what saving faith is to come to be saved this day or a reminder and a renewed burden for those around us who need to have saving faith. Romans 10, let's begin in verse 6. I'm the New American Standard. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, 
or who will descend into the abyss. Uh, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Some of your translations say, others will say, the word of Christ. The essence of saving faith is trust. In other words, folks, I can believe all there is to believe about someone and still not trust them. I mean, I can believe that Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. I can believe that he rose from the dead. I can believe that he is the second person in the Trinity. Man, I, I, I can believe that he's the only way to heaven. But folks, I must trust him. I must put my faith and trust in him. And folks, saving faith is trusting Jesus Christ and Christ alone for one's salvation. But as we open up Romans 10, I want you to see in God's word, hey, what does it mean to have saving faith? I mean, what does the word of God say about saving faith? We're going to see this morning, as we open up God's word, Romans 10, I'll, I'll, I'll lead us through as we unpack God's word to see, hey, what does it mean to have saving faith? What do I mean by saying, hey, there's no faith without saving faith? Well, I want you to notice first from God's word, Romans 10, notice first, number one, that we see there that, that saving faith is faith that is spoken. We see first and foremost, number one, that saving faith is faith that is spoken. In other words, it's spoken faith. It, it, it's faith that speaks. Now, hopefully those of you who have taken notes have got that first point there. I want to show you now that as we unpack God's word, that we find saving faith is spoken through two means in verses 6 through 9, and also we'll see in verses 12 to 13. And the first means we see spoken faith of spoken through is the first means number one it's spoken through the word saving faith is spoken through the word i mean of course the word of god look at verses six through seven look what it says but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven uh, that is to bring christ down or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring christ up from the dead all right, now here Paul is quoting the Word of God. And more specifically, he's quoting the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 to 13. And, and his main point here is that hey, those who are trying to, to find this righteousness to be saved, they don't have to travel all over the universe to find Jesus in heaven or, or travel to the abyss or in, in the ground. That the same faith is right there. God has provided the way for Christ right there to call upon him in faith, the same faith that is spoken through the Word. But the second mean, he also shows us, this is spoken faith through the woe. Spoken faith through the woe. And they say, well, preacher, what do you mean by woe? Well, remember when Jesus said, hey, woe to you, teachers of the law, right? Hey, woe to you, hypocrites. It was kind of a warning saying, hey, beware, pay attention, listen to me good. The woe, spoken through the woe, spoken through the word, but spoken through the woe. Now, I want you to see it here in God's word, Romans 10. It's spoken through two, two different kinds of woe. And the first kind of woe that, that Jesus proclaimed, hey, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you teachers of the scribes. That's first, of course, the woe of preaching. The woe of preaching. Look there in verse 8. Look what he says there. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Hey, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. Now, of course, 
Paul, uh, Paul applies this to the word that's preached by him and the other apostles. But in application, folks, don't think that they're the only ones responsible for getting the word out. Don't think it's just the preachers here. They're the only ones responsible for getting this woe of preaching out. I mean, we all have responsibility. All of us have responsibility to the lost world today to say, hey, woe is you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Hey, woe is you if you die today without Christ as your Savior. Hey, it's the woe of preaching. But not only does he address the woe of preaching, he goes on to also address the woe of professing. The woe of professing. Well, what do I mean there? Well, I'm talking about the, the woe of, of confessing. Confession. You may recall in, in Isaiah, Isaiah says, hey, woe is me, I am a man of what? Unclean lips, right? Man, he was professing that, that woe of conviction. Hey, but Paul's also saying here, not just the woe of conviction, but also the woe of professing Christ as Lord and Savior. Look at verse 9. Look what he says there. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, he goes on to say what? You will be saved. And then we go down to verses 12 and 13 now. He says, verse 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hey, confess with the mouth its evidence of genuine faith. Faith that is spoken, spoken through the word, spoken through the woe, the woe of preaching or professing. And there's power when we, we proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior and what he's done for us. D.L. Moody tells a story of a rich businessman who had a nice family, had servants working in his household, and he goes over to Dublin and he gets saved. He comes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, he comes back home and he gathers his whole family, he gathers his servants, and with tears in his eyes, he begins to explain what Christ has done for him. He confesses Christ as Lord, and he goes to the fireplace mantle, and he pulls down the family Bible, and he opens up the Gospels, and he begins to read from the Gospels. Well, right there on the spot, four out of five of his family members came to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Hey, there's, there's power in the world of confessing Christ as Lord and Savior. You may recall, remember, when Jesus gathers his disciples around, and he starts asking them, hey, What's the word on the street? I and mean, what are people saying about me? Who are they saying I am? You may recall the disciples say, well, some, some are saying you're John the Baptist. Some are saying you're Jeremiah. Some are saying you're Elijah. Some are, others are saying you're, you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus asks them that million dollar question, right? Hey, who do you say I am? And good old Peter. Hey, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You remember what Jesus says to him? Hey, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Man, we are blessed when we confess Christ as Lord and Savior. We are blessed when we confess and profess Christ as Lord. So I want you to see here, first, we unpack God's word. Hey, what's, what's saving faith? It's faith that's spoken. Spoken through the word. Spoken through the woe of preaching, professing. All right, but he goes on now to say that this saving faith is not only faith that's spoken. It's faith that is felt. It is faith that is felt. Now, I'm not talking about the make you feel good emotion. Oh, I, I feel good. That's got to be faith. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that faith. When it hits you in the heart, you know it. Man, when it hits you in the heart, you have that, that, that belief. Paul says here that, that, that believing in faith. I mean, God gave us a heart, folks, but he didn't give us eyes to be able to watch where we're going on the road with our heart. He gave us a heart, but he didn't give, it, give us ears to hear with that heart. Hey, but when you and I experience loss, loss of a loved one, Lost to a breakup. Hey, our eyes can't process that. Our ears can't process that. But what? Man, our hearts sure do, don't they? Man, we feel it. We feel it in the heart. And this is the same kind of, of, of felt faith he's talking about there. Look in verse 9. He goes on in verse 9 now. Where he says, And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in Righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, there's a spoken faith there, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, or your translation might say, put to shame, all right? Man, the heart, it's, it's this felt faith we have, saying it's felt in the heart, we believe with the heart. Now, he goes on to say that, that, that this felt faith, and it's expressed in two ways, all right? 
I mean, this felt faith, he goes on to say that it's expressed in two ways. In the first way, he says this felt faith is expressed, is responding to the resurrection. This felt faith, believing in our hearts, it's a response to the resurrection. Where do I get that? Look at verse 9. Look what he says, verse 9. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, on several occasions in the book of Romans, I mean, Paul makes reference to the resurrection. He reflects on the significance of Jesus' resurrection. And here, straight from God's word, hey, saving faith is having that belief, that confidence that he raised Christ from the dead. It's important to believe that the resurrection is real. You know, this past week, my family and I went Monday night to uh, Darlington Presbyterian. Uh, Kevin Colley's become a real good friend of mine. We went over there to hear Dan Seaborn speak. One on author, uh, speaker, he's been a pastor. And before uh, Dan came to speak, we were singing some amazing uh, praise songs. And one of the songs we sang, maybe I'll know the song. Uh, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. And there's a part of the song where we sang, we believe in the resurrection. And after I sang that, I started getting tears in my eyes. Because I started to think, wow, man, because the resurrection is real, we're gathering here on a Monday night just praising God through song. Man, because the resurrection really happened, man, we're gathering on a Sunday morning praising Him. Because the resurrection really happened, you look through the centuries and you see the fruits of the hospitals and the churches and the schools that have been birthed through God's people. Man, you see the transformed lives of people who come to know the resurrection is real. And folks, I was convicted that if the resurrection didn't exist, hey, Christianity wouldn't have survived. I mean, if it was some myth tale, if, if, if the disciples went and hid the body as the lie that was spread early on, hey, Christianity wouldn't have survived. But because the resurrection is real, and we believe in it, we believe in the resurrection. Hey, we profess we have that faith to believe, folks. Saving faith, resulting, responding to the resurrection, all right? But it also results also in righteousness and reconciliation. Man, this felt faith, it results in righteousness and reconciliation. Look at verse 10 to 11. It's right there. For with the heart a person believes, there's that felt faith, right? Resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Salvation is being reconciled to God the Father. Sin separates us from God. It's salvation that reconciles us to him through Christ and Christ alone. Hey, it results in righteousness. This is a life here, folks. Just because someone proclaims Christ with their lips and proclaims God... That's not saving salvation. And there are many people who say the name of Jesus and God, not out of faith. But when someone cuts them off in traffic or hits their hand with a hammer, that's blasphemy. But when we respond and confess to Christ is, that he is Lord, he is Savior, responding in righteousness, reconciliation. And that woe I just mentioned a moment ago, we say, woe is me, the sinner, but wow is he, the Savior. I mean, woe is me, the sinner, with this sin, but why was he, the only Savior, to take away the sin? Results in righteousness, results in reconciliation, salvation through Christ, Christ alone. All right, so the saving faith, it's, it's faith that's spoken, spoken through the word, spoke through the woe, preaching, professing. Faith that is felt, believing in our hearts, resulting in righteousness, reconciliation, responding to the resurrection. Third and finally, in the last section, Paul focuses on this faith being faith that is heard. It's faith that is heard. And when you look at verses 14 to 17, now you hear Paul gives this emphasis about faith by hearing. Verse 14 through 17. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. Hey, here's like that cycle of good news we spoke about in December. 
But this cycle, the cycle of saving faith, there's the, the messengers, the proclamation, the hearing, the faith. Here's the saving faith there. And calling on the Lord's name. And it's all summed up in verse 17 there. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. But I want you to notice here now in these verses as we finish up here. This faith that is heard, I want you to notice there are three roles specifically to take note of here. Three roles in this last passage here. Notice first the role of the caller. Notice the role of the caller. Look what it says there. Verse 14. How will they call on him? Who's they that call? That's anyone. That's anyone. For God so loved the world that his bound that he gave his one and only begotten son, unique, one of a kind, that who? Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, be eternally separated in hell, but have eternal, everlasting life. Hey, anyone who calls, folks, it's an important call, but it's one that can be made anytime, anywhere. Oh, my God. You know, we talk about the good old days, and maybe you remember the days before cell phones. You younger people won't remember this, but the day before cell phones, we had just landlines. You may recall, if you had to make a long-distance call, and you had to wait until either after 9 o'clock at night, or you had to wait before, you better do it before 8 o'clock in the morning, because the rates went up. And I'll never forget as a young boy watching my dad, he'd wait till after 9 o'clock, and he'd call his family in Oklahoma, or he'd call his sister in California, because the rates went down. But, you know, if you made a phone call when the rates were high, it better be an important call. It better be a, a call that you had to make at that moment, right? Well, praise God that we make this call to call upon him for salvation, but we can do it 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock at night. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, the caller. But now, once we call upon him to be saved, notice also the role of the carrier. Notice the role of the carrier. Verse 14 to 15, he says there, How will they preach unless they are sent? Now don't get caught up in those words, they will preach, the preacher there. You know, it's so easy to look, well, they will preach, those are just those called to preach. Hey, understand when he says they who, who preach, preaching means to share the good news, right? We have a responsibility. Once we call upon him, we become the carrier. And it's understood Hey, they who preach are those to share the good news. I remember when I was a preteen, a teenager, my mom would come home from the grocery store. And she'd open the door and she'd always make the same announcement. Hey, guys, we got groceries. <laughs> now, do you think my mom would just open the door and say, hey, guys, here's the announcement. Your tummy's going to be settled. I've got food to fill your tummies. You think she came home and say, hey, clear the way so I bring all these groceries in by myself? Uh-uh. Hey, guys, I've got groceries, she was saying. Hey, get yourselves out here and carry the groceries in. I mean, it was understood. When mom said, hey, guys, we got groceries. That was my brother and I, whether we wanted to or not. We didn't go up there. We needed to carry the groceries in. So when he says there, they that preach, they that are sent, hey, we become the carriers. When we call upon him and we're saved now, we've got a responsibility to go and preach the good news to share. Not just me, the preacher, all of us. If we are followers of Jesus Christ. All right. We see there the caller, the carrier, third, and finally. I want you to notice the role of the commander. The commander. Where, where do I get that? Well, notice he says, unless they are sent. You've got to be sent by somebody, right? Who's sending them? Who's the one who's sending them? Look in verse 16. Lord, who has believed our report? It's quoting Isaiah 53, a messianic. Uh, passage in Isaiah, right? And they go to verse 17, the very end. By the word of God, if you have King James, New King James, word of Christ, most other translations there. Hey, the Lord. Hey, he's a commander. You and I have no choice. He's the one, who, hey, who sends us? You have called upon me. You got a responsibility to be the carrier. Here I command you. I send you. Go. Make disciples of all the nations, right? Teaching them to be baptized in the Father, Son, and observe all that I command you. And I'll with you always. Right? He's a commander. We have no choice in the matter. Faith that is heard. As I close this morning, folks, we need to understand that this saving faith is not about how much faith we have. I believe, I believe, I believe. Oh, I need to have a lot of faith, folks. It's not about the faith that we have. It's about the faith we put in the right one. There's a story about a, a 
town that had an awful flood and the waters were so high. The town only had two major bridges to cross this major flood river. Now one bridge was an older one and it had these kind of had these, these solid wood timbers that had been replaced, but they were still kind of wood, just tree timbers to cross. They also had a second bridge, a much newer modern bridge. It was cement. But unbeknownst to anyone, it had a major flaw in it. Well, the first driver pulls up and he sees the bridge with the timbers, but he sees this nice modern concrete bridge. And so he drives across the concrete bridge, and in the middle of the bridge, it collapses. Another driver pulls up and sees this flimsy timber bridge of made of these timbers, and he's scared to death. He's just saying, oh, Lord, please get me through. And he drives very slowly, just fearful it's going to crash any moment, but he makes it across the bridge safely. First driver. And he had faith in that first bridge, but he put his faith in the wrong bridge. The second driver. Man, he was, didn't have much faith. He was scared to death, but he put his faith in what, the right bridge. It's not about how much faith you and I have. It's about putting it in the right one. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Folks, that's what saving faith is all about. It's about our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. Hey, maybe there's someone here this morning that needs to come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe the question for you this day is if you died this afternoon, if you have full confidence that you'd be in the presence of Jesus Christ, you died. If you're not so sure, let me give you the good news. Hey, holy God, perfect God, made you and I. God had a standard, you know, law. That law was that there'd be a price for disobeying him. It's called sin. The price of wages of sin is death. We all come in this world, all of us have sinned. That's the bad news. And the, the even worse news is that we've all condemned ourselves to eternal hell. The good news is that God in his love, God in his mercy, God in his grace, sent his son to save us from our sins, to live a perfect life, to go and be dead, to rise again from the grave, paying the price, shedding his blood to pay the price of our sin, and allowing anyone to put their faith and trust in him, in him alone. The Bible says when we do so, hey, we're born again, we're new creatures, we're new creation. We'll continue to sin, but there's going to be something different. We're going to have fruits of righteousness. There's going to be fruits of repentance from that. Maybe there's, you're saved, or maybe there's somebody in your life that you need to be reminded of the reality that they don't know Jesus, and the fact is that if they died today, they would be sent to eternal hell. But this book's I believe that. Maybe there's others of you who have a renewed burden. Maybe God's just putting it on your heart this morning, the importance you and I have to get the good news out. I'm going to tell you this before I came up here a moment ago. I said, Lord, I just pray that you'll save a soul this week through this message. Maybe somebody here, or maybe there's somebody in this room that you'll, you'll, you'll share the good news with somebody in our lives this week, and somebody will come to know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. I want to ask God just to bow your heads and close your eyes, and we'll have a, we'll have a, a, a prayer. And I want to ask you to respond as the Lord calls you this morning. Maybe you've got another decision on your heart this morning. Maybe you've got prayer that you need. Maybe you need prayer for a lost person in your life. Hey, maybe there's a decision that God's calling you to make. If you are saved, if you come to know Him through saving faith, man, you and I have a responsibility to share the good news. We've got a responsibility for being in a church body. You and I have a responsibility to be faithful stewards of our, our, our resources, giving the tithe, giving the offering. And also give the time of our lives, of ourselves. Maybe he's just speaking to you in a personal way this morning. Would you respond as he calls you this morning? Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the truth that Jesus saves. Father, woe is me, the sinner. Wow is he, the Savior. The only one who can take away my sin. And Father, I ask boldly, if there's anyone here this morning who has never come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And maybe they were dumped in a baptismal pool. Maybe they walked down the aisle one time, but they've never truly experienced saving faith. Father, would this day be the day of salvation? Maybe there's someone in our lives that you're burdening our hearts with. The reality that we need to start sharing the gospel. We need to start getting our knees faithfully praying, begging you. Father, it's so easy for us to call upon you during election time, but to the lost souls in our lives daily. How often do we just come before you and pray for those lost souls? Father, I'm convicted that you're just as guilty as the next person. Would you forgive me? Would you renew our hearts to pray for those lost souls, to share the gospel, to ask you to fill us with all boldness, to share the good news with those around us this day and this week? Father, be glorified. <laughs>
And those in this room respond now to your word in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand if you have a time to respond to God?